Hello, everyone. My name is Shane German, the music director at WYCE 88.1 FM in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And today we're joined in our virtual studio by Samantha Crane, Oklahoma-based Choctaw singer, songwriter, poet, producer, and musician. Samantha Crane is a two-time Native American Music Award winner and the winner of the Indigenous Music Award for Best Rock Album of 2019. She has released numerous critically acclaimed albums, all of which are in our WYCE Music Library, and has toured with the likes of the Avett Brothers, Brandy Carlisle, First Aid Kit, Josh Ritter, to name just a few. In 2017, shortly after the release of the album You Had Me at Goodbye, Samantha Crane was dealt some pretty excruciating blows. Experiencing alternating intense pain and numbness in her arms, wrists, and hands due to tendonitis and carpal tunnel, coupled with three car accidents in one summer, and dealing with an emotional and physical breakdown, Samantha Crane wasn't sure if she'd ever physically be able to play music again. After the very slow process of regaining emotional, mental, and physical health, Samantha Crane regained pain-free movement in her wrists and hands and began the process of writing and recording the songs that make up her incredibly intimate and beautiful new album, A Small Death. The deeply personal release sees Samantha Crane in the producer's chair and infusing lush, subtle textures and leaving the internal and external turmoil behind her and beautifully moving on to her next chapter, Rejuvenated. Please welcome to WYCE, Samantha Crane. What's that silence? inside me that expands into the dark where the traffic lights are changing with no one anymore the karaoke laughter tumbling out the door might as well with contemplation the pleasures I endure Holding to the edge of night Holding to the edge of night Holding to the edge of night
But as the sun sets around me, it strips the other sense away. I am a legend of this land Here I am a keeper of this life So when I die, however that is I'll just say evening was my prize And I keep holding to the edge of night Holding to the Edge of Night from the new album, A Small Death. Welcome to WYCE's virtual studio, Samantha Crane. Samantha, how are you I'm doing good. today? I'm good, thank you. It's nice to see you. We were talking right before we got started We had that you have a, a history with Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, you used to live here, uh, and you have actually been in this studio uh, several, several years ago, uh, but uh, we're thrilled that you're back again uh if not virtually yeah I, it's been i guess 12 years since i lived there but um yeah i have good memories of grand rapids well uh, first of all first and foremost i want to uh, ask how are you feeling oh i'm feeling okay you know i think i'm just taking it a day at a time um I don't know if you mean in reference to my own struggles with which I wrote this album about or just the general in, feeling in, of uh, <laughs> craziness around the globe. Um, both things I just take kind of a day at the, a day at a time, I think. How are now you're uh, currently in Norman, Oklahoma, correct? Yeah, I've lived here for about five years now. And how are things down in Oklahoma in terms of, uh, you know, the pandemic and you isolating kind of down there? Uh, how are things going? Um, I'm still pretty isolated. We had sort of a, uh, we were one of the first states to sort of reopen um, very prematurely. Um, so we had sort of a influx of cases again. Um, I, I don't, I'm still just kind of like, I, I'm of the uh, opinion that I'm just going to stay in my house. And then if, if, if and when it's time for me to come out, someone will probably come knock on the door and be like, you can come out now. It's been like a year. <laughs> yeah. So I I guess I really haven't been keeping up too much with it on a day to day yeah. basis. Yeah, I'm the same way. Uh, you know, I stay at home. I come into to my, our work. We've been closed since March to the public. Uh, but I go straight to my office. I've got my mask on. I shut the door. I go through all the music and do all the charts and everything that I need to do. Um, and then, you know, people walk by my office window and they wave and they've got their mask on. But for the most part, I've just been minding my own business, staying uh, uh, isolated pretty much um, uh, and uh, seeing people here and there, but at a distance. But for the most part, I'm with you. I'm <laughs> I, I could just stay in my house until this whole thing <laughs> passes over. <laughs> Have you ever seen that movie Blast from the Past? It yeah. Was like mm -hmm. where they, the family during the like uh, Cold War, they're like in an underground bunker and nobody comes to get them. And so they're just in the underground bunker forever. That's how I feel like it might happen for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you've, the new album is absolutely stunning. Uh, when it came, when it came in, uh, I, put my headphones on and I listened to it and I, I immediately emailed Lindsay Reed at, uh, 30 tigers and said, this album is stunning. And he was like, I'm so glad you like it. Uh, you know, we obviously have history with you. We've got all of your albums in our music library, but there's, 
something very special about this record, and I think it's because of uh, what you have gone through uh, since the release of your last album, uh, You Had Me at Goodbye. There's a lot to unpack here um, as a listener, so I can only imagine how it felt for you as the artist to peel back all of the layers to even get to the point to be able to um, put the tracks down to, to create this album. <sighs> Let's talk about that. Um, kind of give, a, give our listeners what you've gone through um, the past few years. Yeah, so um, I guess start, the record kind of started um, inactively back in 2017. I released um, a record called You Had Me At Goodbye and my i've always struggled with tendonitis and carpal tunnel um but it's been somewhat manageable and um hasn't really affected my ability to tour or write or anything like that but um around that time that the the record was released um i was in three car wrecks all in the series of one summer I like to preface that with saying I was, uh, I was hit all three times. Like mm-hmm. I was not, I'm not just like a horrible driver that shouldn't be out on the road. Um, it was just sort of like a string of bad luck, I guess. Um, but the first wreck was quite bad and sort of exacerbated a lot of the physical issues that I was having with my, my hands and my arms in the first place, just due to like, uh, musician wear and tear I guess and it got so bad that basically it got to a point that I couldn't I would wake up in the morning and there would be like an hour before I could really have feeling in my hands or move them and um, it just kind of got worse and worse uh, to the point where I just wasn't able to use them and it was just so painful and that really affected my mental health because um, I was sort of faced uh with all of a sudden with this um this issue of well who am i if i can't play music i just said it's just like what i've done my entire adult life so i just have never really had to think about it um or think about i i guess who i am as a person outside of that and so i was really coming to terms with that um maybe prematurely uh, prepped for what people are going through right now in terms of coronavirus quarantine, because I was kind of just like in my house uh, for a whole year, just sort of cooped up dealing with this uh, mental and physical sort of breakdown. And slowly um, through various therapies, I, both physical and mental therapies, I sort of got to a point where um, I could start playing again. And during the time that I wasn't making music, I was keeping sort of these audio diaries of just me, like talking into a tape recorder every day, just as sort of a form of, uh, therapy, just sometimes they were coherent. Sometimes they weren't. Sometimes, um, they were like poems. Sometimes they were just conversations with, you know, people that I imagined or myself or something. And um, when it got to the point where I could write again, I sort of started drawing from those audio recordings and all of the songs um, came out pretty quickly. I wrote all of the songs on this record in a, in a period of uh, about a month. So, and, and went into the studio pretty quickly after that. I was just like really excited to make music again because I had gotten to the point where I didn't think that I I would be able to um was kind of dealing with that and and okay with it but um whenever I got the chance to again I was it kind of felt like a bonus round I guess like um like it was my I guess fresh start and um maybe that's why the record I think the record feels really special because it it does feel um, really immediate. Like I I just needed to get it out and wanted to make sure that it was um, that everything about it was 
a true reflection of myself, which is why I produced it and which is why I had so much to do. I, I directed the music videos. I, I had a lot to do with the creative direction behind the artwork and things like that. So it was very much like my manif my manifesto, I guess. I was just like, if I never get to make another record, I want to make sure that this one is like the best that I can do to go out on, I guess. <laughs> And then not only that, but to do it uh, coming from a place that almost, I mean, you almost didn't, weren't able to make music ever again due to your crippling, um, you know, carpal tunnel and then the, the car accidents and then on to add on to that, you know, the depression and the revisiting the trauma, um, you know, and as a, a working musician, when your livelihood is, you know, at stake, um, and then being exasperated, you know, with the stress of, can I continue on as a working musician? Um, like I said in the beginning, there's just a lot to unpack because you've gone through so much and to pull yourself out of it and then take the reins and, and take control over every aspect of the creativity of this album is quite remarkable. I read that, um, um, you said only recently did you become emotionally intelligent, intelligent enough to know what you were thinking or feeling and that you got to know yourself from scratch, pulling off a costume that you were put into as a child. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, I got involved in music um, really early in my sort of independence, I guess. Like I, by the time I, I'm, I'm I kind of left home right after high school and sort of started down this pathway of um, being like a touring musician. And when you're in that world, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of life lessons or just relationship uh, lessons that you don't get if you're kind of living within a community, a, like a stable community of people. Um, you learn to sort of, uh, I think, cope with things in some really like unhealthy ways through drinking and drug use and things like that. And um, just not really, I, I, th I think not really being held accountable for your actions and not really taking the time to, to get to know yourself because you don't have to. You're like in a different city every night. You're... Um, in a world where people aren't asking you to be, I guess, a responsible, decent human, you're just there to like play songs and make them have a good time because that's their like break from life. Um, and so I think I put off a lot of that for a long time. And then whenever this sort of stage in my life happened where I was all of a sudden faced with nothing but time to think about uh, I guess my life up to that point and how I had, um, how I had like approached certain situations or relationships. Um, I was just all of a sudden faced with having to put like a name to a lot of those and, and realize my reactions to it. And that's, I guess why I use the term emotional intelligence. I think they, I heard somewhere that like most people right off the top of their head can only name like six emotions or something like that um but there's like 60 so a lot of that has to do with how you're processing things in your life in terms of realizing when you're scared or um, embarrassed instead of just like sad or something mm -hmm. like that um and i think realizing a lot of that helped me write this record in a in a i think more in depth and thoughtful sort of way, I think. Um, I think it's relatable to what a lot of people are going through right now, trapped in their house without um, their normal jobs or, um, I guess, dis normal distractions to get them to a point where they don't have to deal with that kind of stuff, those thoughts going into their head. Um, but they're just having to right now because they have nothing but time to mm -hmm. like dig into those things. It certainly has uh, happened to me. Uh, I mean, in this whole situation, I have had to rethink uh, a lot of things, um, you know, family trauma that I've kind of been suppressing for years. 
I've still been in therapy. We've been doing th- virtual therapy, but even in that, in this time, I've been able to identify things um, during this whole crisis that I think I was suppressing for a lot of time, and I'm really starting to like peel back layers, and I actually feel like I'm more productive uh, in terms of the work to get healthier w- mental health wise mm-hmm. um, than I've ever been um, in in recent memory. So it's very strange the way that this thing has kind of kicked certain other parts of me uh, into a positive path. Uh, while the wor- world is crumbling around me, uh, I seem to be getting, uh, uh, doing a lot of internal work to be a healthier person just mentally and physically. And um, so I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from on that. Um, and I think it's great to talk about it. Um, um, I'm a big advocate for talking about mental health issues and things of that nature openly. Um, yeah. um, I think that it um, has potential to help others uh, in doing so. So I'm glad that you're very open about uh, your struggles with it as well. Um, it's certainly helped me. Um, th- the songs on this record, uh, they're like little journal entries. Uh, one that really sticks out for me is a song called Constructive Eviction. Um, and it's really about getting rid of a friend that's really not a great friend, uh, uh, which I've had in my time in my life. Um, there's nothing worse than a crappy friend. Uh, <laughs> there really isn't. Uh, and it's like once you make that realization to like lose that dead weight or to lose, um, to basically evict that person from your life, uh, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Talk to me about uh, the song Constructive Eviction. Yeah, I think that that song is the most um, straightforward song in this record. It's like the least sort of layered meaning song. Um, I think in my own life, because of sort of this life that I was explaining to you, like all through my 20s, just sort of being city to city and uh, bouncing around and not really having the experiences of making really close friends. I think what that kind of developed in my mind is that the friends that I had made, um, I didn't really need to like do inventory on to make sure that I was like being treated right in those because it was just like so rare to me to even have those sort of relationships. And um, yeah, I think it's like anything else, you know, those healing processes take time and attention. And when you're just so busy going, 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 and you're not allowing yourself to really take something and look really deeply at it, like, what is this doing for me? What am I doing for this person? Um, Is it more positive than negative? Is it more negative than positive? Are we helping each other in any way? Um, those are questions that you have to take like time to even answer and unpack. And if you're not giving yourself that time, you're not going to do it. And that's kind of this particular relationship, this particular friendship um, during this time in my life when I had nothing but time to be kind of taking inventory of these things. I just realized how awful they made me feel all the time um, and how that was affecting me, sort of making me Uh, act that way to other people as well it's just like a negative influence in my life I think and um so yeah the song I think was the mantra to get to the point of of sort of having that conversation with that person I tend to do that a lot in songs sort of mantra myself into better decisions in my life um I think a lot of people think that it's a like I've I've done something and then I've written the song about it, but sometimes it's the other way around where I have to like write the song and then and then do it and then deal with it. Yeah, yeah. This this album, like I said, it's almost every they're almost like little journal entries, and you can really identify with each one. Uh, there's a so- great song called "Tough for You," um, where you talk about uh, biting through your lip and uh, with a quivering chin and a single tear. I I wanted to be tough for you. Um, and I can just imagine you as a child wa- uh, wanting to uh, uh, remain strong or tough for, for maybe a parental figure or whatever, not to be a problem, um, not to add any more stress to maybe a, a st- already stressful situation. And we've all been there um, as children. Uh, one of the most beautiful songs on it is a song called When We Remain. Um, and in it, uh, you 
saying uh, in your traditional Choctaw language, and I read that you wanted to write a Choctaw version of a protest song like We Shall Overcome. Talk to me about that beautiful song. Well, the um, I think writing in, in Choctaw became really important to me um, a few years back whenever I, I started having conversations with a lot of young Indigenous artists like myself, um, who are constantly strugg- struggling with the feeling of not being Indian enough or something like that. And it's just something that we consistently have talked about, um, feeling like there's this chasm between what we are able to create and what our ancestors were creating um, or not feeling like we have access to those traditions. And I think the thing that we all kind of decided was like, that's not our fault. Like that was something that was brought about by years of genocide and land removal and allotment and um, government schools and all of that. Um, that was that was the aim of, of a lot of the programs that were put in place by the federal government without getting like too political or anything. That's just like history. Um, so yeah, the the goal was the eradic- eradication of of um, tribes in in this country, and so that feeling that we have is purely rooted in sort of this, I guess, like stereotypical idea of what um, Native American art or music sounds like or looks like. Um, it's all based on sort of antiquated, dead Indian stuff. And I think that's, at that moment, it kind of hit me, like, the language remembers all of this stuff. The language can help me bridge that gap between myself and my ancestors. And it can also help me create new traditions. Um, it can help me realize, and it can help empower me and other Indigenous musicians to say sort of like if if I make something if I write a poem or if I write a song or if I cook a meal or if I um make a painting that painting is Choctaw because I'm Choctaw it's not like because it looks native enough then it's Native American artwork or something like that or Native American music it's just if I'm making it then it is Choctaw and I think having the confidence that the language is a tool to like have the confidence to to constantly be telling yourself that. And that that is what allows us to to be a living, breathing, um, surviving people, I think, is is sort of the continuation rather than sort of getting caught up in the goal, which was for us to feel disconnected. Um, it helps us rebuild those bonds of connection. So that song, When We Remain, Okla Imaya Momakma, is, it basically means um, while we are still here, I guess more literally translated to when we remain. And and I guess I just wanted, I wanted it to be sort of like a song that like Pete Seeger would sing it like a protest in the 60s where we could have a song to sing through our struggles and into our victories um just just like as we keep moving as we keep existing it's absolutely beautiful Uh, the whole record is absolutely beautiful whether or not you're singing about going to your high school reunion uh or you know uh, being tough you know uh, as a child even though you're in pain uh, dealing with, you know, friends that really aren't, uh, it's just, it, it just resonates from beginning to end. It's absolutely a beautiful piece of work. You've got all sorts of beautiful textures on it. Uh, you've got saxophone and trumpet, uh, pedal steel guitar. It's just very layered. Now you took over the producer's chair on this one. You fully did it yourself. You usually work with John Vanderslice, but for this one, you did all of it yourself. You kind of changed your recording style on it. Usually you would go in and do it in one shot but you had to take breaks uh on this one uh to walk away from it and kind of recharge and then come back to it talk to me about the production of it um 
so, so yeah, normally when I work with John Vanderslice, who's done my the previous f three records and an EP, um, we book like a chunk of studio time and we just go in and like get it done. And that creates this like real sense of place and time, which I, I have liked a lot um, in terms of making a record. And he works really well that way. And it's just like this exciting, like you look back and you're like, oh, we just made a record. That was crazy. Um, with this record, knowing that it was my first time producing my own record and, and watching John over the years, um, knowing how much a producer is not just somebody that makes decisions in terms of like arrangements and, you know, instruments and EQ and compression and things like this. Um, they also are a bit of the project psychologist like they have to keep things moving and like understand you know why people aren't performing in a, in a, in the way that they need to be for a song or how to communicate certain aspects of performance so i knew that there was a lot tied up into it and i knew that because this record was so close to my heart and because i had such a clear focus about what i wanted it to sound like that there were going to be times that I was going to need to like step back and figure out how to communicate and how to uh, get into people's heads about what they were thinking and stuff. And so because of that, I didn't want to rush things. I just wanted to kind of take it two or three days at a time. So we booked a studio in Oklahoma City, just north of where I live, um, a place that it would be really easy for me to get to, a uh, place that it would be really easy for a lot of the musicians that we're going to be playing to get to and uh, we would just kind of go in for a weekend and then the next weekend so we'd have all this time in between to uh, rest which was like the idea for me I think and I guess just from a sonic perspective the idea that I was trying to get across to the people that play it on the record was um, kind of a sense of fever dream, I think. I There's a song on the record called High Horse, which is um, really about that feeling of when um, you can remember a memory, but you can't remember it innately. Like, it's like when you're watching a home video of yourself and you're like, I know that's me. I know I went through that. Um, I remember it because I'm watching it, but I don't really remember it um, personally, like, being there at the time, and how that feeling is kind of cloudy and also lonely, because it feels like a stranger lived your past, but it's also really, uh, at the same time, exciting, because it just shows how many reincarnations you get throughout your life, how many new chances you get all the time. Um, that is a very complex feeling, and I wanted sonically the record to encompass that somehow, um, to keep it very organic feeling, but also sort of incorporate soundtracky sort of vibes into it. I was listening to a lot of movie soundtracks at the time, um, Michael Andrews and um, Johan Johansson and that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, that was sort of where my mind was at from a production standpoint, I guess. Well, it's abs absolutely beautiful. It's lush. There's layers and textures. And then with your very intimate songs, um, it's just an exquisite record. A Small Death is out now everywhere. Uh, we have it in our music library. Uh, I'm sure you've been hearing it a lot uh, on our airwaves. Um, our programmers have really uh, responded to it, and so have our listeners. Do you mind if we hear another song from that record? Sure.
stops from movies and baseball games from the cracks in my textured walls weeps the loneliness that falls into the pit of my stomach in this black like a new apple but at this point i've mapped it out i know the shape of a great heartache and i know the weight of a big mistake I know the sound of a warm crescendo falling away. We could have made it last. I tell myself that when I'm talking to myself. Disagreement seems as natural as a plant bending towards the sun. And from that high horse where I sat, you were also up there on your own. And we both were in shock But these days I know the drill And I know the shape of a great heartache And I know the weight of a big mistake I know the feel of a magic moment fully explain and so do we just act normal do we smile even now so many years pass but I know And I know too much now So many years pass But I know And I know too much now I know the shape Of a great heartache and I know the weight of a big mistake I know the depth of a sinking love You couldn't persuade Yes, I know the depth of a sinking love but I persuade High Horse from the new album A Small Death by Samantha Crane. Samantha, thank you so much for yes, joining thank us you for today. Having me.